Hi there, my name is Don Tipping, and I'm a farmer here in Williams, Oregon. I'm at Seven Seeds Farm, which is the home of Siskiyou Seeds, which is an organic family farm-based seed hub and seed distribution network. And today I am happy to share a talk that's near and dear to my heart. I call it Seeds on Migration, about the origin of 14 important domesticated plants that really are Part of the foundation of where civilization has uh, come to. So diving right into it, over the last 14,000 years or so, from which that at that point that's as far back as we can trace um, evidence of domesticated plants, and that was some toasted uh, barley seeds in Jordan in a cave that were 14,000 years old. We have incredible biodiversity, and part of that comes from the nearly 600,000 species of plants that blanket this earth. So here in this picture, we're looking at about four or five species of beans and just a, a little tiny window into the incredible biodiversity just in seed coat. So we're looking at common beans, Phaseolus vulgaris here, runner beans, the, the large ones, you can see some pink ones with black flecks, sort of upper center, that's Phaseolus cosineus, Phaseolus lunatus are these beautiful, uh, it's kind of zebra striped black and white and red and white beans, those are lima beans, and then we also have the tapari beans and mung beans in this picture. And that's, we're just talking about seed coat, we don't even um, get into vining habit or you know, drought adaptability or growing length or any of that kind of stuff. And how we got to this is many different human peoples over time had a unique eye of what they saw as beautiful and useful as their food plants. And through sharing this in a region, uh, a region may come to grow all the same type of a certain crop. And with colonialism and trade routes and different uh, you know, geographical movements of peoples over time, we've shared an incredible amount of useful plants with one another and really increased the well-being of humans and our ability to create culture and art and all the other things that spring from that because of the foundation of having reliable food. So here's another snapshot into diversity with fava beans, uh, which are, are very commonly grown in the Andean uh, mountain regions of Bolivia and Peru and Ecuador and a bit in Colombia and Chile. So here you can see these are, this is Visia fava. And most people have never even eaten a fava bean yet. In Mediterranean regions and in the Andes and other parts of Mesoamerica, they're a very important staple uh, crop. So this is one way that we can look at this, and I honestly think the gender should be reversed here. I didn't create this image um, that the, the woman should be on the seed breeder side and the man should be on the normal people side because I feel like women, and by and large, have a, a deeper um, inquiry and inquisitiveness about the nuance of color. But this just goes to show those that work with plants are just perhaps a little bit more curious about all the different ways that plants can show up. Um, here's just looking at colors, and this is a bit of a tongue-in-cheek joke. But coming around to, you know, where did farming originate, we can see these various biodiversity hotspots. And this came out of the work of Nikolai Vavilov, uh, V-I-L-O-V. And he was a botanist in Russia in the late 1800s and early 1900s who during his lifespan, went through a number of periods where famine was a big deal. So through that, his curiosity led him to explore other agricultural regions of the planet and come to the conclusion that there were these certain hotspots. So we'll dive into this more, but this is what's interesting about agriculture is it didn't start in one area and radiate out from that point. It co-arose uh, in these different parts of the earth at different times. And you can see with the key there, uh, they say about 9,000 years BC, we do have some evidence 
of barley seeds in Jordan in a cave that are 14,000 years old that were toasted. So there is some evidence a bit older this, but you can see there in the Middle East and in India and in China and also in Mesoamerica and in New Guinea, ironically, where sugar cane's from, that agriculture began at that time and then over time spread to other parts of the earth. Then Vavilov's work identified that there's these certain areas of the earth that have much more domesticated plants that originated from there. And what's interesting is you can overlay these eight biodiversity hotspots, what are called the centers of origin. And Nikolai Vavilov wrote a book about this, um, these, these centers of origin, that they pretty much mirror areas of the earth with high natural biodiversity of total plant species. So again, you can think if you're a painter and you have more colors to work with, then your resulting painting will be more rich and varied. So the peoples of the earth that lived where there were more species of plants had more choices basically to work with. So those main centers, I'll just quickly go over them is in southwestern China, um, in the kind of Indonesian, um, Thailand region, Malaysia, the, and that's predominantly because of rice. India is another one, and then the Fertile Crescent, which we all learned in school. Four would be the eastern Mediterranean area. Um, apples would be one crop from that area. Five would be the western Mediterranean area. Broccoli and so forth um, came from there. Six in Ethiopia predominantly where coffee and wheat came from. Seven would be Mesoamerica which is corn, bean, squash and tomatoes. And then eight would be the Andes which is a number of uh, chili species but also potatoes. And then 8B, you can see in 8A, there's some other ones like pineapple and a few other things, peanuts that are originated in some of these areas. So I, I want to back up and just kind of look into pretty much all plants. The higher flowering plants can be divided into being either monocots or dicots. And that refers to either a single seed leaf or two seed leaves. So the monocots, the grasses, make one leaf once the seed sprouts and then they make more after that. Whereas a dicot, as soon as they sprout, they make two leaves. And what's interesting is the monocots have a larger endosperm. So as, a, as opposed to the dicots, because they have to use more of that internal storage of the seed to make those two cotyledons. So a dried monocot seed, like a wheat seed or a corn or rice or barley or rye, has more food uh, you know, storage potential. So what's interesting is that the major civilizations of the earth pretty much originated around the monocots, the grasses. So we can think corn, wheat, and rice. And up until that, uh, the domestication of those plants, humans lived in smaller tribal village regions and we didn't have large civilizations. So having the ability to grow grains and harvest them and store them meant that you had the food storage to have empire and civilization and that that could become a source of value. It could be tokenized and monetized and used to hire laborers to build cities and that kind of thing. So it's interesting just to see that the, the difference has been the storage of the endosperm on the monocots versus the dicots has most likely, I, this is just my idea, it has a pivotal um, role in the origin of civilization. So the first crop I'm going to go into is wheat, you know, our daily bread. And wheat co-originated in Ethiopia and Syria, the triticum, Avestium, and that has these two centers of origin. And the early wheats were much more primitive than what we uh, know of now. We grow one here on our farm. This is it here called Karosan wheat or Kamut, and it's a very tall ancient wheat, large grains, very long ounce, the kind of 
pokey things, and that keeps birds out of eating the grain, or you know, somewhat. Um, very tall uh, lodges would not lend itself well to mechanical harvest, whereas a more modern wheat is going to look like this, shorter stature, shorter arms, less straw, whereas in ancient times the straw was very valuable for animal bedding, for thatching, um, early beer was actually uh, filtered through the barley straw, and straw was used for any number of important tasks in early villages. So when we look at the difference between ancient weeds and modern weeds, and then we have you know our soft white weeds and our hard red weeds, that's our, a red wheat is kind of the more brown one there, and a, a white wheat is the other one. Wheat originated, I'm going to back up here, um, as a, um, a diploid. It had a lower chromosome count, so those early ancient wheats were a diploid, and then as we developed durum, uh, wheats for pasta. As wheat moved into the Mediterranean, it became a triploid, and then our modern wheats are tetraploid or hexaploid. And again, this process of increasing the chromosome count came about through crossing of different um, ancestral and land race varieties. And as humans interact with plants over huge periods of time, hundreds or thousands of years, we tend to induce polyploidy, which is a higher chromosome count, which means that you have more traits to select from. So a cousin of wheat would be barley, and some people um, postulate that agriculture originated not for bread, but for making beer, and barley was malted. And the malting process, if you're not familiar with it, is the sprouting of grain, and then at a certain point you roast it to stop that uh, plant growth. And that increases the sugars, and then that malted barley is fermented in water, and then you have beer. I read once that during the construction of the Great Pyramids in Egypt, that each worker was guaranteed five pints of beer a day, because I imagine water supplies, if you had a lot of people in an early city, were suspect. And beer, by virtue of the fermentation neutralizing pathogens, uh, was a reliable, not only calorie source, but drinking water, or, you know, liquid source. So barley can range from two row varieties, like the golden variety there, to the six row, which is the more uh, gray-black variety there. Um, Here's some, uh, an example of some other barley diversity. This comes out of the Oregon State University Bread Lab. It does a lot of work on barley and increasing biodiversity in this, in this beautiful loaf of bread they baked using the different colors of um, land race barleys. And basically, you know, barley is predominantly used for beer, although it is important as a livestock feed, um, and most people don't eat it as a grain. And here's another way you can see the difference between two row and six row. And the early barleys were all two row, so you had less grain per head. But all of that extra straw and chaff was important because the it was necessary for the filtering of the mash for making beer. So more straw, more uh, you know coarse material to the grain meant it clarified the resulting liquid from the mash better than a six row. And six row barleys are typically your livestock barleys, although nowadays the beer making industry is looking more and more into six row because we have modern filtration systems and polypropylene mesh and stuff. I don't think people are filtering their beer mash through straw anymore. Here's another uh, just glimpse of different phenotypes in barley seed heads. So the next uh, major cereal grain would be corn, or as most of the world calls it, maize. And the Latin name of corn is zia maize, M-A-Y-S, and that uh, you know comes from uh, the common name of maize comes from that. And corn originated in the highlands of Mexico as a subtropical, very photosensitive grass called zia mexicana that we call teosinte. Here is what that looks like, and it was a very, um, it didn't have a cob. It kind of, to me, it always looks like little chicken beaks. Um, and 
this was not really grown as a food stuff, but this was the where corn came from, and people probably noticed variation in teosinte over time and selected for larger, uh, you know, cereal grain size uh, seeds. And you can see what it's come to is these large ears with large seeds and many ears per plant. So here's another uh, glimpse of perhaps where that went. Uh, so corn is what's called an imperfect flower. It has male and female parts in separate locations on the plant. Some plants are what are called perfect flowers, like uh, sunflower, and they have both male and female uh, pollen producing and receiving. Uh, parts in the same flower. So in corn, the male pollen producing part is the tassels up high that produce the pollen, and the pollen receiving part, the female, is the silks, that is the flower that receives the pollen. And we can see a bit a, a evolution of how corn became what it is now. And different cultures around the world domesticated corn for a whole variety of different uses from making flour, to hominy, to pozole, to popcorn, to grits, and um, sweet corn, so many different uses. Um, a plant dye, uh, a beverage. And so here, this just is a, a little glimpse into that. And here's another glimpse of different landrace Mexican corns. And most people are familiar just with sweet corn or maybe with popcorn, but there's an incredible amount of diversity of colors and shapes and kernel shapes in corn. Uh, we've been working with some land race varieties. This is uh, many different varieties all intermating together. We call river spirit rainbow, trying to get something that adapts to our climate, which is a fairly short season, but long days, hot days in southwestern Oregon here. We call this river spirit rainbow. Rice would be the third major cereal grain, and to kind of review up until this point, if we look at the major civilizations of the earth, we have the wheat people, which would be northern Africa and the Mediterranean cultures of Europe, and then we'd have the corn people, which is Mesoamerica and a bit down into South America, so the Aztecs, Mayans, and other peoples in that area. And then we have the rice peoples uh, throughout China and uh, Burma, Thailand, Indonesia, and so on. So rice is a subtropical grass. This is what it looks like as a plant. It typically is growing in wetlands, and hence the typical paddy uh, culture for growing rice. Rice is unique in that in modern times it's still transplanted, whereas corn and wheat are largely mechanically planted on large acreages. Rice is still planted on 4.6 million square miles, and it represents 30% of the global cereal production. So wheat, corn, and rice account for more than 50% of the calories consumed around the world every day. So here are rice seed heads uh, ready for harvest. And here is a little snapshot of some of the many varieties of rice. Uh, we tend to just see long grain, short grain, white, and brown rice, but there are many, many varieties, uh, typically in, in, in areas where rice is grown. Uh, at the time of the Green Revolution, 1978, 79, there were 30,000 varieties of rice grown throughout India. After the Green Revolution, there were predominantly eight varieties. So we've lost a lot of wonderful adapted land race varieties that had certain uh, qualities that were favored by both farmers and people that ate the rice. I have a cousin that lives in Thailand and I remember one time his wife brought her own red rice from Thailand because they just needed that for certain dishes and saw whatever rice was available in the U.S. as inferior. So here's this is an interesting look at the spread of rice cultivation. And rice has been adopted by many cultures throughout the world. And in many of the places of the world where either wheat or rice or corn was grown, now they grow 
all of them if possible. So the southeast of the U.S. has become a major rice growing region, as has parts of the Central Valley, obviously South America, North Africa, and a lot of Asia. Potatoes are definitely not a grain, uh, but are represent a important source of calories for many people on the planet. And there is an incredible diversity of potatoes in the Andes, upwards of 500 varieties. And there's a potato park in Peru where they still steward some of these traditional varieties, some of which were not used as food, but were used as a, uh, a dye or for freeze dried, for a storage crop, or in different cultural uses. The most popular potato or you know, what really brought about its widespread adoption in modern times was the Luther Burbank russet. So this is the familiar baked potato to those of you in industrialized nations. And there's a black and white picture of Luther Burbank, who's most likely the most famous and uh, prolific plant breeder of modern times. He, he bred the Luther Burbank uh, russet potato, and that really got him going on breeding another 800 or so varieties of food and ornamental plants. So just back to potatoes for a second here, an interesting story around potatoes. Again, the Latin name is Solanum tuberosum. They're, again, they were from the Andes and they've spread after the Colombian, uh, you know, occup colonial occupation of North America and South America. And they have a much higher food value per acre than cereal grains. Uh, they're 2% protein and 18% carbohydrates. And what's interesting about potatoes, as opposed to the other cereal grains we've covered so far, is a, a bag of wheat, you don't have to eat it all in a given year. You can save some of it for a year or two or three. It doesn't uh, go bad, whereas potatoes in storage eventually will sprout or rot. So you have to replant them or eat them. But one thing that was an advantage in Ireland, for instance, and I imagine a similar scenario has uh, taken place in other parts of the world, is, for instance, British troops might come through and commandeer food among Irish peasants, and they would say, you know, give us food for our soldiers, and they would look in their barn or their storage and see sacks of grain and be able to take it. Whereas potatoes, you could leave in the ground, and the vines would die back and wither in the winter, and the people could say, well, this is all the food we have, and the potatoes could go unseen. So through different times in history, people have adopted potatoes as a staple crop, not just because of their productivity, but because of their invisibility to marauding soldiers or you know what have you. Um, and, and of course, in Ireland, this led to the, in part, the, the potato uh, famine in the late 1800s because there was such an over-reliance upon potatoes as, as opposed to having a diversified food supply of other grains and vegetables and so on uh, that they suffered immensely because of that. So onions, while we may think of them more as a uh, seasoning, are the most concentrated way to grow sugars, carbohydrates, for per acre. Because onions are in the lily family, they are a store of sugar. And if you've ever caramelized onions, you realize that they are quite sweet once you get past the sulfur, that is the spiciness. And onions can be planted very close together. So onions were originated in Southwest Asia, uh, India and China about 5,000 years ago. The Latin name is Allium sepa. And the bulbing onions that make a large bulb can be grown in the more northern or southern latitudes because they require, they're very photosensitive. That bulbing is a response to a change in day length. Whereas the ones that look more like scallions, those would be grown in more tropical areas. And if you've ever been to a tropical or subtropical market, you will see more bunching onions than you will bulbing onions, like this. But all of the onions originated from plants like this. This is Egyptian walking onion, and it makes these bulbils atop a stalk. And then eventually those fall over, and they sprout, and hence the onion walks about 18 inches at a time. 
and onions being a lily, these bulbs would uh, begin growing probably from some wild plant much like this in the floodplains of the rivers of India and China. And then when the floodwaters recede, early agricultural people would go out and gather these aromatic onions, bunching onions, and it, it probably inadvertently redistribute the bulbils and then the onions would begin to become weeds around the settlements of these early agricultural people. And then over time, the bulbing onions were developed through selection and breeding. Garlic is basically a cousin of onions. It's um, Allium sativum is the Latin name. Uh, there's many different varieties and kind of subspecies within that. This gives you a little glimpse of in some diversity. This is from Avram. Uh, who has garlic anna near me in southwestern Oregon. And garlic mostly originated in China, but also in places like Uzbekistan and Kyrgyzstan. And it's, it was probably a wild plant, much like I described onions. A very important crop throughout history was hemp, not so much for smoking it or using it as a medicinal extract, or whatnot, but here's what the plant looks like. The previous picture was obviously the seed, but hemp was in a very important source of fiber for not only cloth, but also rope and for sails for ships. So this is what fiber hemp would look like, planted close together for tall stalks because the stalks were where the fiber was extracted from. This is what it looks like. There's an inner core and people grind that up into what's called herds, and that outer fiber is what's used to make clothing or rope. And here's what the uh, fiber looks like in kind of coarse skeins. Uh, here's what the herds look like, and people nowadays are using this for uh, building materials. But what's interesting about the fiber, we'll go back to this picture, is that the War of 1812 fought between the U.S. and the British was largely over the British contesting Russian ships bringing hemp in to help the U.S., still a very new nation, develop its um, naval fleet. And at that time, a three-masted schooner, the type of boat that you know a, a navy would have, required 60 tons of hemp the raw material to make the ropes and sails for a ship of that nature. And the U.S. had not scaled up its hemp production domestically, so it was still relying upon Russian imports. So by the British trying to cut off those Russian uh, shipments of hemp to the U.S., the British could maintain their maritime superiority over the U.S. But of course, we know they lost that war, and the U.S. grew lots of hemp and flourished uh, for a time. And so hopefully we'll see with this, this resurgence in hemp production that uh, hemp will become a important fiber crop as well because right now we've deferred to a lot of synthetic sources for, of nylon for rope and clothing and so on and you know, industrial fabrics and cotton as well, which cotton is an excellent plant. However, it does require a lot of chemicals and the regions that can be grown in are fairly limited to warm uh, subtropical areas. So another very important crop throughout time is chilies, capsicum annum. Um, and there's that's the main species that we know of, but there's about five or six other species that largely came from Mesoamerica, like central Mexico, down into the Andes of Ecuador, Peru, Bolivia, and so on. And this one here, this is Capsicum uh, fructescens. It's a small kind of land race variety. This is the Capsicum annum, and these would be like a cayenne pepper. And what's interesting about the cayenne is that it was actually originated in Hungary. So that provides a little insight into a curious twist in, in history. So basically, Christopher Columbus was commissioned by the Queen of Spain to go find a new source, a new region to import black peppers because at that time without refrigeration much of the meat that people ate was spoiled or on its way there. So black pepper could be used to mask the flavor of spoiled meat or other spoiled food and also just make it more interesting. 
So at that time, the, in the late 1400s, chili peppers, uh, I'm sorry, black peppers, were worth twice their weight in gold. So you can see why uh, empires would want a new source. So obviously, as we know, Christopher Columbus did not find a new route to the Indies. Instead, he wound up in the New World in North America and discovered chilies being grown by the native peoples of different areas around there. And their flat seeds are quite spicy. So he wound up bringing back um, a bunch of this, and it seemed like a suitable substitute. And what's interesting is, so that journey, as we know, is 1492, or they probably made it back around 1493 or so. By 1520, chilies were already being widely grown throughout India. So when we look back at that first journey that Christopher Columbus did, and he was Italian, and he was commissioned by a Spanish uh, queen, but his crew was largely uh, Portuguese. And as a result of the Spanish Inquisition, there were many Muslim and Sephardic Jew, Jews that might have comprised the crew of these ships. And they had an eye for spices due to their ancestral links to the spice trade throughout North Africa and the Middle East and Asia. So obviously chili peppers would find their way into the cuisines of all those cultures fairly rapidly. And from the accounts that I've read, these uh, spice traders who were on these ships, these Spanish and Portuguese ships, making journeys back and forth from the New World to the Old World, would oftentimes load up on things like chilies and other things that didn't have as much value to the Europeans and they would stop in Tunisia or Morocco and offload some of their special cargo to the vestiges of the spice trade, and it would wind up back um, going, you know, reverse along the spice trade. And I've heard at that time too that we all know this image of the pirate with the gold earring, and that earring was any sailor would have that gold earring, and it was to show that you had the money to pay for your burial in case you were to die, to transport your body back to your family for a proper burial. They would you know, take that gold earring off and use that to pay for that. But oftentimes sailors would keep a satchel of black peppercorns in their clothing to help compensate their family for the loss of uh, most likely a son. I'm sure there were some women that wound up being sailors too. This is the uh, habanero type. It's a capsicum chinensis. So coconuts are another important crop, and I'm really using this to uh, be the poster child for all of the canoe crops. So coconuts, being the largest seed on the planet, uh, they float, and we actually don't know are coconuts from Polynesian areas or Brazil because they we can carbon date to both those areas and other areas in South America way back because they floated across the Pacific and started sprouting on the shores of any air where coconuts could grow that rimmed the Pacific. This image shows a number of the canoe crops, whether it's bananas or coconut or turmeric or noni or tea uh, or taro. So the Polynesian peoples would be able to transport cuttings or tubers or you know, seeds, in essence, of these plants and be able to establish a polyculture of different useful and edible plants wherever they went. And it's a really fascinating study to look at the spread of these canoe crops. And this is an image that looks at how far that spread a long time ago. So the coconut, the uh, in Brazil, they say there is one use for every day of the year. And the um, one of the names of, out of the Indo-Pacific is monkey face because somebody thought the early uh, nuts looked like a monkey face. And there's evidence of it growing in New Zealand uh, more than 5,000 years ago. And nowadays we're seeing widespread use of coconut, not only for coconut water, obviously the coconut meat, um, but also the fibers from the husk are used in agricultural um, applications as a soil amendment and um, obviously the palms themselves are really important stabilization of 
various coastal areas. So coffee is a highly important uh, crop that originated in Ethiopia and there are four species. The co We have two common ones that people consume today. Uh, Marco Polo first introduced coffee to Europe in the year 1292 and in many ways we can credit coffee for the um, the Renaissance and people basically, as coffee houses sprung up, here's uh, an image that shows uh, you know the green berries, the cherries, uh, and then unroasted seeds and then roasted seeds. But as uh, coffee shops sprung up around Europe and people were all you know highly caffeinated, all these new ideas began to uh, circulate. And in a lot of ways, the Age of Enlightenment evolved hand in hand with a, a marked increase in the consumption of coffee and people beginning to challenge the superiority of the church and welcome new ideas of science as explaining reality and we saw you know society and culture shift from that point to this day another uh, highly important crop throughout time and really the only important food plant native to North America is sunflowers. Helianthus annus, although there are about 30 species native to the Americas, um, the Hopi people of the desert southwest, Arizona and New Mexico area, domesticated varieties, and then later by the time it made it to Russia, it became an important oil seed crop that could be grown in northern latitudes because if we look at other oil uh, plants they need warmer growing areas where sunflowers can grow all the way up into Canada or in Russia obviously. So here are the large oil seed type heads that have been bred for seed production. Here's a heirloom variety this one's called Mammoth Russian Here is an edible tuber type sunchoke, and many of the uh, species of the native landrace varieties produce a, a tuberous perennial crop. And what's interesting, there's a, a great book called Alcohol Can Be a Gas by David Bloom, where he looks at and compares making alcohol for fuel from cereal grains like wheat, uh, and that produces about 70 gallons of fuel ethanol per acre. If you go to Sunchokes, you can, because they make a really heavy uh, tuber, one plant might make five, six pounds of tubers, whereas one sunflower head might make a few ounces of seed, and one uh, wheat plant only may make an ounce of seed, if that. So sunchokes produce a prodigious amount of biomass that's high in sugars that can be fermented to produce alcohol, and it can produce up to 700 gallons per acre. So holds a lot of promise as a perennial uh, crop where we could be growing our own alcohol fuel that could be run in any vehicle that runs gasoline right now with just some simple modifications. Pepper is a highly significant crop throughout time. Again, I referenced when we were talking about chilies, that the ability to spice food that for most of time throughout Europe before Marco Polo brought onions and garlic and peppers and coffee and various things from Asia and then later with the Colombian expansion bringing all the crops from the New World, pepper was highly significant particularly for seasoning very bland northern European meat and uh, dishes that would include things like rutabagas and parsnips and turnips because they really didn't have a whole lot else up there. So the there is a pepper tree, but the black peppercorns that we use today come from a vine. This is what they look like in cultivation. There are different varieties that produce different colors, the black, white, green, and red. And highly significant uh, to this day for culture, but particularly with regards to slavery as sugarcane, because no crop drove humans to crazier extremes than sugar. It's 
highly arguable. So sugarcane saccharum officinarium is basically right up there with heroin, cocaine, alcohol, tobacco as the most addictive substances on the planet. It originated as a wild tropical grass in New Guinea and it began to be refined in India into concentrated sugars over 2,500 years ago. It made its way to Europe by the 1300s and Venice is the first evidence there. Here is a man harvesting sugar cane. The part that produces the sugars is that stalk that looks like this. It's pressed out and then to produce refined sugar that, that juice is evaporated into what we know as modern sugar. But over 80% of the slaves that were taken from Africa were brought to South America, predominantly Brazil, for the cultivation of sugar for primarily people to put in their tea in Europe. And uh, if you've ever been around a sugarcane plant, the leaves are highly serrated and cut you. And I can only imagine what miserable work that was tending, harvesting, and processing sugarcane in tropical environments. And it's well worth studying uh, the history of sugarcane up until this point, just to see the incredible human toll that is it exacted on particularly peoples of African descent. A more modern crop that's coming into um, the limelight is cacao. And interestingly enough, it's from uh, Mexico. It's a small tree and this is what the fruits look like and then the seeds are extracted from a fleshy pulp and then roasted. So and when you think of how corn, I mean uh, coffee is roasted as is cacao um, to, to actually make it into a useful uh, foodstuff. Another thing about cacao is it can only really grow successfully either 18 degrees north or south of the equator. So very limited uh, range of where it can grow. And a lot of the production nowadays is coming from Africa. And a lot of that is being done by child labor. So it's really, if you're going to eat chocolate or any kind of cacao products, try and support some kind of equitable, fair trade, organic uh, situation because the increased demand globally for chocolate is driving unsustainable farming practices and, in my view, unethical labor practices. But originally, the way cacao was consumed by the Mayans was as a bitter beverage, sometimes with chilies. And the Latin name Theobroma cacao means food of the gods. Other people call it the love bean. And the Aztecs also grew it, and it was a toast to Quetzalcoatl. So there's just a, a quick whirlwind through 14 plants. And as you can imagine, we could keep on going and have remarkable stories about so many things. And one of my hopes in sharing this little pictorial journey and talk is to encourage more curiosity about different regions of the world, different plants, and the traditional peoples that noticed wild plants growing and slowly over time uh, bred them, selected them into the plants that we know and love today and eat regularly in our food. So perhaps we can be more curious about the other cultures and um, learn from them and continue to evolve with our plant relatives and become one human family. So all blessings to you.